thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for giving me the chance to um, present part of my work here in this webinar. And I thought since it's a seminar on applications, I will talk about the application that I mostly work on or that I've worked mainly on in the last years, which is pedestrian dynamics. And um, since it's Christmas, I thought, okay, let's do a bit of a Christmas. The thing is on the background, you see um, a Christmas market, something you are not going to see in Vienna at the moment. Unfortunately, this is the Spittelberg. It's one of the most beautiful Christmas markets. And um, if this pandemic is over, I hope you have a chance. Um, and yeah, gather and stick together in the crowd again. But we're for the moment, we leave it as it. And yeah, I wish you all the best for the holidays that are coming up. I'm going to talk about two things in this um, seminar. The first part will be about mean field models. And I will talk about a very simple mean field model to describe pedestrian flows. So I will give you an update, first of all, how you can model pedestrian flows and how you can use PEEs here to understand the dynamics of pedestrians, large crowds in this setting. In the second part, I'll talk a bit more about how we can connect data with these PDE models. And for both parts, you can see my collaborators here. So there is Annalisa Juro, Gaspar Jankavovic, and Peter Smolian that are um, contributed to, to the first part of this um, talk, while in the second part, I will talk about work with Susanna Gomes and Andrew Stewart. Okay, so let's get started. And just for everyone who is not so familiar with pedestrian dynamics, I'll give you a bit of an overview, just very briefly. I mean, there's a huge literature out there. I'm not going to touch this in any great detail, but just to give you an idea where we are heading from. So um, the simplest way or also the most intuitive way to talk about pedestrians is to say, okay, um, I'm going to model them individually. So I even, each individual has a position X, I in space and some kind of velocity. And in the most sec natural setting, you can say, okay, you have a second order system. So your position changes with the velocity. And then you um, change the velocity depending on the forces acting on each pedestrian. So here we have the velocity of the ice pedestrian. We calculate the forces and these forces depend on the positions as well as the velocities of all the other individuals. So what you can include here is, for example, that if you um, look around and you see somebody approaching you, then you might want to step aside. You don't want to run into a wall. This all goes into these forces. And um, if you don't add the noise term, then this is very well known in the community as the social force model, which was first introduced by the Kelbing. Um, you also might want to add some noise since your pedestrians are not walking in straight lines. I will show you trajectories later. And so you allow them to wiggle around. You also might want to consider um, a bit of a simplified setting, instead of going to a second order microscopic model, you use a first order microscopic model. So here we all have the overdamped Langevin equation, our position changes according to the forces acting on my particles. And again, we do add a noise term here. So this is what um, <clears throat> you can also do if you want to simplify the setting. Um, situations I'm not going to touch today are two more um, possibilities. You can also use, for example, a stochastic optimal control problem. So you have your individual, it has again position xi, and it wants to figure out how to move, for example, to an exit as efficient as possible. If it's a perfectly rational agent, you can minimize some cost and calculate the optimal trajectory, and there you go. It's a perfectly fine assumption. It's computationally costly. You can also have some kind of lattice-based model. And what you do there is you just have a checkerboard. I'm just briefly going to sketch this. So here I have my checkerboard. It'll take a while, yeah, here we go. And if I want to locate an individual at a certain site, then okay, here we are. And I assign some rates to jump to the other sites. So then you can, they are called lattice-based models. This is a different type of model, cellular automata. I'm not going to touch those today. So if you then move up one level and you say, okay, I want to have a look at a um, PDE model because the microscopic description is much harder to analyze. What you can do is you can say, okay, instead of assuming that you try to describe the entire each entity or each pedestrian individually, you want to describe the, ten, the density of pedestrians. So it's now a function row of X and T. And what you see here is that it defines some in a very general way 
a conservation law. So if we remind ourselves, so for a conservation law, sorry, is equal to or divergence of rho times b is equal to zero. So what I assume is that um, I'm not creating or destroying any of my pedestrians. Then um, you can have this very general form that you see here on the bottom, and I'm not going to discuss this very much, but um, this relates to your velocity. And so you can have terms driving individuals, for example, in a certain direction. So this would be um, a potential. So this is a potential term here, the V. So this gives me an external potential, which then shows us in which direction we are going. You can have the W star tag in convolution with rho, gives us interactions with others. And the first one is an internal energy. And I wrote it as rho times V. You could also have some D of rho, which is a nonlinear diffusivity. And if you come from um, traffic flow models, you might find this a bit of in similar to existing models. So one of the most famous one is the LWR model in, in traffic flow. And um, the reason I'm going to, I'm showing you this is that the models that we will have a look at in a minute have a similar structure. And what you assume is in the LWR model, which is just for a single road where cars are going in one direction, that um, you do have a conservation law. So here this um, gradient of phi, what this gives you is just the direction of motion. And um, you assume that your velocity of the individuals now depends on the average density. One of the simplest relations that you can have here is the so-called, what is called fundamental diagram. And if you just plot this, then what you have is here, if I have a plot, then I have here the density, I have my velocity, and uh, this is really the most simplest one, is that if the density is going to zero, then I'm moving with me max. When I'm approaching the row max, then the velocity is zero. Very simple, you plug this in, this is the LWR model. It relates to Burgess equation and you might have seen this before. Okay, but let's go back to pedestrians. So what do I know about pedestrians? Since um, I'm going to talk about pedestrian dynamics and how we can collect them with data, I just wanted to briefly mention what kind of data is available. And there are two um, big classes of data where you can find, so to say, data sets in the literature. And um, they depend on what setting you're considering. You can look at data that is collected um, in everyday life. So you take video surveillance data. And what is also very popular is if you have an Xbox, you might know the Kinect. Um, this is a depth camera. And it produces images that you can see here on the right. So this is an image produced by the Kinect. And it just gives you a height picture. So the depth, so how, how big the distance is. The nice thing is it's um, anonymous, so you don't have to have any issues with personal rights or anything. And you can extract um, individual positions from these depth images. So you, these cameras are installed and you can get real data. The second um, type of data, and that's the one I'm going to focus on, is experimental data. And um, there are different groups working all over the world, um, looking at different experiments. And what they do there is um, they have, um, they conduct certain experiments in controlled settings. So what you can see here is um, a crossing flow. So we have individuals, they have sensors on their head, or, or they have like, they have heads and the cameras, so to say, track those individuals. They have an own software. And on the right, what you see is the pedestrian data that is extracted from there. So you can get the individual trajectories. So there is a, a lot of different data out there. Whatever you want to use, you can find it. So if we now look at this um, data, which is available from Jülich, then here's a zoom in. What you can see here is um, that th these are the heads of all these individuals and they're tracked. And then they can extract, they have a software which is called P-Track and you can extract the density and the, um, also the average velocity of the cars. And then you can plot this. And if you look at them, their works, you can see, for example, here, this is what they call a fundamental diagram. So here we have, again, the velocity versus our density. And you see this decrease in the velocity. However, this is only in a certain range. And you can see Germany 1 and Germany 2. I think these were two different age groups. So you can see sometimes also that um, you can also see cultural differences. So people in Asia move faster on average than um, people in Europe. Uh, so this is specific to the situation and the experiment you're considering. 
and it's also specific, um, as I said, to the group of people you're considering. But in principle, what you observe in there is that if you have a fundamental diagram, then um, what is in, oh, sorry. So this is my velocity and this is the density. Then often you start out with a certain velocity at the beginning, so we have. Then you have the first drop and after that it goes down again and up on the bottom here you come into a regime where you have stop and go. So these are stop and go waves. So what's happening here, first you can move freely even so the density is increasing. Then you have to slow down and at a certain point you really see this linear decrease with the density. Okay, but let's get started with some math first. We have no, known a bit about the um, different kind of um, models that we see in pedestrian dynamics. And what I want to show you right now is um, a very simple PDE model and how we analyzed it to try to get some understanding how do in boundary conditions influence actually the density profiles that we're going to see. And um, what did we consider? Um, I'm looking at something which is called the unidirectional pedestrian flow. So in this setting, what I have is that I have a corridor. So here's my corridor. And um, I do have an entry and an exit, uh, uh, an entrance and an exit. So, okay, that was the wrong scene. Here we go. So here, this is my entrance. It's called gamma. This is my exit. It's called sigma. And I have a unidirectional flow. So individuals are just walking in one direction. And um, on the right and the left here, I just have my walls. So here, nobody can run into my walls. It's a very simple experiment and you can go to Ulich web page and you can download all the data for that. And um, what do we see here? So we have again, a conservation law. That's what I have here. And now I say my flux has actually this form. So you see a diffusive part and you see this term, which is rho, rho minus rho, times u. So if we remind ourselves, I assume that v rho, v of rho is v max times one minus rho over rho max. And if I now assume that both of them are equal to one and the u is just a normalized given vector field, then if u is just equal to the vector one zero, then you obtain exactly what we wanted. So you see what I get for the flux. I have um, rho times one minus rho because I had the conservation law um, which um, I'm just stating here on the top. The special thing about this equation, because if you look at this, this is not something very hard for PDE people, are actually the boundary conditions. So we have two types of boundary conditions and we do have nonlinear boundary conditions. So we have an inflow boundary condition, which is given here, and an outflow boundary condition. And what you see is, is the flux in normal direction is proportional to alpha times one minus rho. We remind ourselves that one is the maximum density. So this means that I can enter at the rate alpha, but it's modulated by the people or the amount of people that are already present at this exit. So one minus rho gives me how much space is there left. So I can only get in if there's enough space. At the exit, I don't have this. So beta is just my outflow rate and I can just leave the domain. Okay, so can I have a look at this? And if you just go to the simplest setting that we have a 1D corridor. So there's nothing going on very, I mean, nothing. It's, it's just very simple. So I have my entrance here and my exit and um, individuals move to the right. Then you can use ODE techniques. So this is not terribly hard to um, analyze the um, dynamics of uh, this equation. And you can even cut write down an explicit solution. So, and what are we going to see here? So we see something on the right-hand side, which I would call some kind of phase diagram for alpha and beta. So depending on the alpha and beta, you will see different um, uh, regimes appearing. So I'm just using the same color because it's a bit easier to see. So it's called the in, oh, that's bad. Here we go. The inflow dominated regime. So what you have here are profiles, which looks as follows. So if, um, you have a line, so row equals one half. This is my first line. And now I'm going to have a look at these profiles. So you can see them here in the purple plot. It is that towards the exit, you see a boundary layer and you're always smaller than the value of one half. So this value corresponds to row equal one half. So you have a low density regime and you have a boundary layer at the exit. 
Then you can also go to the next part. This is now my outflow, then to, um, outflow limited regime. And what you see here is that you actually have um, a much higher inflow than we have outflow. So what um, I'm just going to plot this here quickly because it's a bit hard to see. I'm sorry about that. So this is again, my line rho is equal to one half and I want to now um, draw it. So here, this is the outflow dominated regime. So you have, so to say, a boundary layer at the entrance and a high density, because this is again rho equal to one half, and the green one is um, a maximum flux. So there is alpha fairly close to beta. And you can calculate all these regimes and um, you can get an explicit, uh, so to say, formulation of the whole thing. That's nothing too special. Okay, but um, what we're actually more interested in, I mean, I just showed you something which is a straight corridor, which is not the most terribly exciting thing that we have seen so far. But what happens if I have just a corridor or a bottleneck where I have a room and then um, things get a bit like you have some bottlenecks so people have to queue in front of it. And if you do the numerical simulations of this model, you see very interesting profiles. And it looks like these profiles are just glued together. So you take the stationary profiles that you see here, these three thingies, and you glue them together. Only the interface conditions are unknown. And what's the aim of this first part of the talk is actually, can we say something, how these things are glued together? And can we say anything if we have more complicated geometries than straight corridors? Because I mean, here you can analyze things easily. You can write down the equations. Okay, but first of all, if I wanna do that, I need to make my life a bit simpler since um, doing the analysis for, for 2D is a bit too hard. So what we do is we consider a radially symmetric domain. So for the time being, I assume that my bottleneck is sufficiently smooth. So I can't handle at the moment anything that's too, too complicated so, um, or too, too not, re not regular or very regular. So here's my X direction, here's my Y direction. And I assume that I have a weight function or a width function of my domain. That's W of X here. And again, we have our um, entrance and I do have my exit. And now what I'm going to do is I assume that everything is radially symmetric. And I assume also that um, my vector field is radially symmetric as well. So this has these assumptions. Then this implies that the density and the solution of the um, PDE will be radially symmetric. And it allows me to integrate my conservation law with respect to the Y direction. So what I'm doing here is now just integrating this and I'm averaging over the y direction. You can do a bit of um, averaging and a couple of assumptions and you can derive a 1D approximation of this model. So how does this look like? Again, uh, we have my 1D model. So I went from 2D, assumed everything is radially asymmetric. I averaged and now I'm again at 1D. But what appears here is a coefficient K of X. And this K of X encodes my W, that was my weight function and just to know this is a rescaling. I also rescaled the equation in, uh, in X direction suitably. And it includes the average flux over the cross section. So this information now all goes into this um, prefactor K of X. And the question or what I'm going to briefly outline is, okay, can we say something how the alpha, the beta and the K of X um, have an influence of what is the influence on the structure of stationary profiles. So why am I interested in these stationary profiles? You remember, you saw these boundary layers at the exit and the entrance. So these are these points where things could get crucial. If I have a bottleneck, they will appear at the bottlenecks and we would like to know, okay, can we glue those together and say a bit more? First of all, one would ask, uh, you, you're coming up with this approximation, is it any good? And um, so here on the right, you can see the geometry that I'm considering. So this is my straight corridor. This is just a very simple closing cone shaped corridor. And then here, it's a bit hard to see. This is my first bottleneck and here it opens up again. And um, you can choose, or there are different ways how you can calculate the, um, the direction to the exits. The simplest one or the most popular one is by solving the iconal equation. There's also a proposal by Tosin and Piccoli using the Laplace equation and we compared those two approaches. You can see, and it's a bit hard um, 
the dashed lines always correspond to the solution of the 1D model, while the, the, the solid lines are the solution to the 2D model. And you get a full agreement in, uh, in the straight corridor, which is not very surprising. While you do see some differences, for example, in um, cases of bottlenecks, sometimes, depending if you have a smoother um, vector field, then the difference here is smaller. While here you get singularities for the iconal equation, which um, it's a bit hard to see. I'm going to zoom in if this is working. Yeah, then you see here there is definitely at the interface some difference. So it depends on which situation you're in. Um, the 1D approximation gives you a good solution, but you have to be a bit careful. So it's just um, also to kind of highlight this. Okay, but what can we do for the analysis? And what we do here is what is called GSPT. Um, just to say it right correctly, geometric singular perturbation analysis. And I learned this from my co-workers, Annalisa and Peter Smolian. And first of all, um, if I go back to my PDE, then you remember that I had this prefactor and I'm going to rewrite my system now in the following way. So I had my, I want to find stationary states. And um, <clears throat> to do so, first of all, I need to rewrite or introduce a function g of x. So this g of x is just one over k times k prime. And I'm giving, assuming now that this quantity is smaller than zero, which corresponds actually right to the case where I have a closing um, channel. So this is now my channel and it has to be sufficiently smooth, but could be some kind of corridor, which is just narrowing. And what I do then is I introduce an additional variable, which is uh, denoted by Xi, and I'm parameterizing along the solution of my, uh, of the solution of the stationary profile. And if I then go to um, the original old PDE and just um, set it to zero because I want to get the stationary state, then I can rewrite the system in the following way. So J dot is now minus G times J. Then the J, the flux, that's the equation that you have here on the bottom. That's, it's just the equation that we had for our um, flux expression before. And I introduced this, this trivial equation that Xi dot is equal to one. And you can do the same with the boundary conditions. So just rephrase them. Okay. So now you rescale your system. So GSPT, so to say, zooms in into these two directions. We have boundary layers and we have um, the layers where you have, these are the slow variables. And what you can see is if you rescale, so you introduce this new variable here, then we can, as I said, so prime now denotes the derivative with respect to Xi. So if I have this, then this is the Xi. I can rewrite my system. So this is not um, just a bit of math. And now we have a look at how do the equations actually behave in the different, um, as we said, epsilon equal to zero. So what GSPT does is it looks at the singular profiles for epsilon equal to zero for the two systems, for the unscaled and the scaled system. And then you, um, so to say, follow the solutions um, from on the slow and the fast manifolds and glue them together. Okay, let's put this together first. So we remember that we now have our scaled system and I want to get a singular solution. So I set epsilon to zero in my singular system. This is this one. This gives me a trivial solution. So this is just a uh, trivial system. And I can actually define my um, manifold of equilibria, which is just this parabola that you see here on the right. So if I have now a solution in the, what we call the layer problem, so this is the scale system where we zoomed in, then um, it has to lie on this manifold and you can calculate which part of the manifold is attractive and which one is repelling. So this is the first part. So this is our layer and this corresponds usually to this boundary layers. Then the second singular solution that we construct is by setting epsilon equals to zero in the young scale system, which gives me the reduced problem. So I go back to my original system and I set epsilon equal to zero, which just gives me this ODE system that you can rewrite in terms of rho and psi. And what you see is that this is actually um, singular for rho is equal to one half. On the right, you can see this is the solution to this reduced problem now in the rogue side plane. And it's symmetric with respect to the line one half. And you can, as I said, it's singular right at rho equal to one half. 
And what GSPT is doing is it's now gluing these solutions together. And you have now different parameters in this system. So you have your function G, you have the A, alpha, and the beta. And depending on this alpha and beta, we can identify six regions where um, how you construct where solutions have the same structure. And I will show you how you do that. So you can say that in this six region, each solution is glued together by similar or um, singular solutions. So on the next slide, I show it to you. So we remember we have our um, layer problems, which are at the exit and the entrance. And in between, we have what we call this reduced flow. So we start at psi equal to zero, which is my entrance. And here, you remember I had this manifold. This is row equal, uh, this parabola. And the straight lines now correspond to the boundary conditions. I told you it's like that rho is equal to alpha times one minus rho. This just defines straight lines. And it gives you the points where um, you can start or where you are allowed to, um, so to say, um, start your um, solution. Then you travel along your reduced flow. And if you look now, this is the 3D picture here on the bottom. What you do here is you start out at this point here. Oh, it takes a while until it shows up. And then you travel on the reduced flow until you hit the right-hand side, which is the exit. That's psi equal to one. So now I'm in the right picture. And here again, I have the boundary conditions that you, the flux times n is equal to beta times rho. This again defines me a straight line. And with this straight line, I get the finishing point. So we remember we have here on the right-hand side, the first um, layer problem where I get my starting point. Then I travel along my reduced flow. I hit my right-hand side and then I jump up to the possible solutions which are so defined by the boundary values on the right. Okay, so you can put this together and you can again get a diagram in alpha and beta which shows us the different um, regions that we have. And actually we do have more regions. So you remember um, in the last um, plot we had um, three regions, the blue, the red, and the gray, uh, green. But now I do have an additional region, which is this G3, which does not show up in um, the previous diagram. However, this part, um, the, the boundaries of these regions, they depend on the initial and the final value of your weight function, so or of your width function. And if this is a straight corridor, this um, row F and the row, they coincide and the G3 region is vanishing. So this is compatible. And so you can calculate different profiles now for a closing channel. You can play a bit more. I mean, you can do this numerically and have a look at what is going to happen if you have um, a piecewise constant corridor. So in this case, you really, we go and um, have a corridor which looks like this. So I have, I think here it was, the radius is one, then it goes down to one half or something. And, so you have this nice bottleneck region in there. And you can see very, very different profiles. Um, they are all look like they glued together and we can construct or we can give you solutions with GSPT and prove that they're actually solutions if the solution is, uh, if, the, if the domain is uh, smooth. So if it's like an approximation, then all this, this is fine. Um, if it's approaching, if you have singularities, we're currently working on that. And what I explained to you, I just want to point this out, was I, we glued together the GSPT solutions, which are solutions for the case epsilon equal to zero. However, under certain conditions, you can then generalize the solutions. And if you turn the epsilon on, so you have a bit of diffusion, what we know is that the smooth profiles are indeed also solutions to um, the viscous problem. And um, this was my work with um, the, my collaborators here, and since I don't have too much time, I just wanted to give you a brief overlook what you can do. So these techniques allow us to analyze simple models and see what the effect of boundary conditions or also what the effect of these bottlenecks are. And then in the end, you can get simplified models where you can calculate more explicitly or understand how these profiles, which really just in the settings you see, this is one of those profiles we saw before. This is one and how you glue them together. This is a really, really nice thing. And we're currently exploring this a bit more. Okay, but let's go a bit more to the application side. And um, I showed you the data that we had before. And um, now the question is, if I have this very simple model, 
then can I connect it with pedestrian uh, data that is available? And can we estimate parameters in this model? We remember we had the Romax and the Vmax. And this is joint work with Susanna Gomes and Andrew Stewart. And we go back to the very original setting. And um, yeah, I should have uh, copied it, but yeah, let's remember again, straight corridor. I make my life easy. We all move to the right. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> and I have my exit and my entrance. So this is my um, sigma and that is my exit. So here are my individuals moving and I wrote it down a bit differently. So you see, again, my unidirectional flow. I now allow that I have a different diffusivity in the X and the Y direction. One could consider that. And I still have my unscaled form. So you remember I had the V max times one minus rho over rho max. And um, my driving potential is just E1, which is walking to the right. We have seen the boundary conditions. So this is our setting. What are we going to consider now? And the first thing that you do is you scale your equation if you're a good um, mathematician and you probably screw it up many, many times or not. I usually do. You introduce Rotilda, you do the analysis. And what you realize is actually that um, the row max is not present in this scaled anymore form. And if you do identification, you will see that it's almost impossible from the data that you have at hand to identify the row max. So from the following, what we're going to focus on is now, if I have a PDE model, which um, is, I can interpret as the probability distribution function of a corresponding underlying microscopic model, can I use realizations of this microscopic model to identify parameters in the PDE? So can I identify the Vmax? Okay, let's see. So first of all, what is the corresponding microscopic model? So if I want to now, I say I have this PDE, then it's well known that um, if you have underlying dynamics, which are given by, it's called the mckean Vlasov process, then um, the pro probability density function, the PDF of this process, satisfies the Fokker-Planck equation that I so showed you before. So what does this look like? So we have individuals, they have again a position X in space. We do have some noise, that's what we're going to see here. And um, there's a driving force. And in this mckean Vlasov process, what you assume is that not the individuals feel every pro other in, um, pedestrian as we assumed in other models, but they're influenced by the density of the process. And the F is just the function that I showed you before, it's rho times one minus rho or rho max. And now I have realizations that looks like this. So this is our realizations of this um, mckean Vlasov process, five of them. And can I use those to estimate the Vmax and the rho max in the fundamental diagram or in the PDE? So as I said before, the Romax drops out in the scale formulation, so it can't be learned in the end. So we really focus just from the time now on, on uh, identifying the Vmax. How do we do that? Um, I will use the Bayesian framework, which allows you to attain a posterior distribution of this um, unknown parameter. So remember that I want to estimate the Vmax and I want to get some um, posterior distribution, I want to quantify the uncertainty in this estimate. Quantify uncertainty. <clears throat> to do so, what you do is you define your data misfit function. So um, this is your data misfit function here. Here we go. So um, you say just x dot minus is equal to minus f, which are the forces. And in weighted by um, this d is our diffusion matrix. I mean, this is almost truly infinite, so you can't do very much with this thingy. But you can, if you assume that your noise is Gaussian and under certain assumption, you can show that this is actually equivalent to for minimizing this function of psi here, where one of the um, integrals here, it has to be interpreted as an ethos, so to say, um, integral. This is a bit of um, math behind, I'm not going to touch this, but this is a fun function that we can actually minimize. And you want to either sample from this um, posterior distribution, then you can get, so to say, you can quantify the uncertainty, or you minimize the negative log likelihood, then you get a point estimate. And this is what we do. It sounds now very fancy, but 
how do we do it in the end? And this is just what this PCN algorithm shows you, the preconditioning, preconditioned crank Nicholson. And so we want to find the optimal Vmax. So I pick some V0. Okay, this is my starting value. And um, the YK is a new proposal. So based on my previous proposal, I assume that there are, um, I do have some kind, uh, I have a prior um, assumption on the parameter. I generate a new proposal YK. Then I calculate the value of the integral psi, which involves again solving a PDE. And with a certain probability, I'm going to accept this. So this is the probability of acceptance. I'm going to accept this value, in particular if it gives me a better value. So if it fits the para, um, if it minimizes, uh, may, yeah, gives me a smaller value in the functional, then I'm going to accept the Vmax, otherwise I reject it. So you just kind of, in a very systematic way, start to try and test what kind of Vmaxes give me a better value in my functional, or of my minimization functional. And this is kind of, yeah, you explore, so to say, the whole space in a smart way, but the crux of the whole thing is um, you have to solve a million times the PDE, because each time I'm going to generate a Vmax, I have to calculate the respective density profile, which goes into the functional, and so this is a bit of a costly thing here. However, you can do it. And so what's going to happen then is then you can test. So in our case, what we did is we um, varied different parameters and we looked at different settings. And the beta is um, just, if we look at this, this is um, the parameter here in the preconditioned crank Nicholson that tells you how much we explore the data space. And the nice thing is um, you would like to get consistent um, results. So the IA and the B, I'm sorry, correspond to alpha and beta. We called it A and B in the second paper. So um, these are the different um, inflow and outflow parameters. So we check this for different settings. So you can see here different regimes. And each time we vary the beta, so how much did we do we explore our space? And you see the dark, the black dark, dark line. This is your prior. The dotted line is the truth because we generated our trajectory. This is a toy problem. And then you can see what the posterior distribution look like. And you also observe that you really have a nice um, agreement. So you could identify, given a certain number of parameters, uh, part trajectories, your unknown parameter quite nicely. And we did this for different regimes and we got fairly consistent results for them. Um, you can also play a bit around. So um, in our case, what we did was um, you can vary the number of trajectories. So here you can see that we had um, different types of trajectories. Does it help you if you have more or less? We still get um, diff, uh, quite consistent results. You do see if you have very few trajectories that, uh, well, your results don't get too good. And you can also play a little bit if you have um, a different uh, stationary or a time-dependent solver. So instead of solving the time-dependent PDE, you can also assume that you have a stationary PDE, then you can get very consistent and similar results. So that didn't influence it too much. So this was just, we generated our trajectories with the SDE, and then we took the PDE and had a look, okay, can we identify parameters? But life is a bit more complicated. And first of all, we thought, okay, what's going to happen if we take a more general domain? And this is my bottleneck that I showed you before, and it's a bit of a jerky plot, but um, here we have our, um, yeah, just the entrance, exit, bottleneck. Then you have to calculate. So now you have to make a, a 2D simulation for the PE, or you average in the Y direction, but here we did the 2D simulation. So you have to calculate your velocity field U, which gives you the direction. So this is the solution to the Iconal equation. Um, that you have to solve. So this is what you pre-calculate. And then you can also have a look, okay, what is going to happen? Can I identify the parameters? So here again is our true value. This is our prior distribution. And we also um, tried and mini to minimize the functional. I told you, you can also negative, uh, minimize the negative log likelihood. These are the, this gives you the maximum as of a posteriori estimator. And we see that both of them, I mean, the map estimator doesn't quantify uncertainty, but they converge to the same thing, which was again, very, very nice. At the moment, we are trying to um, look at different, um, a more, let's say realistic regimes. So in this case, we're, we're really using trajectory data. 
So what is happening here is that I'm now using trajectories and I try to find the, I don't know the alpha and the beta and I don't know um, the different, uh, the Vmax in this case. So I'm trying, so to say from real trajectory data to estimate um, the, the Vmax. And uh, you can see here, for example, these are the iterations of an MCMC. So at the beginning, it's kind of a wobbly and then it converges. And I have my prior distribution for the Vmax, which is 1.5. And if I use now the data that um, I'm interested in or that I'm going to use, then you see we do get consistent results again. However, um, we're struggling a bit at the moment. And the reason is rather um, simple. What we assume is in the, all, if you look at the data, and I should have prepared this a bit better, is that in the, um, uh, the data that is available is from the Forschungszentrum in Jülich. And this is what, where they do unidirectional pedestrian flows. And they have all the experimental data. And one of the assumptions in our model is that if I average the data in the y direction, for example, or I mean, is that, that, that my model is in a stationary state so that you can, um, uh, that the density that we see and observe is actually stationary. And if you take all this data that you have from Jülich and you average, so these plots here that you can see on the bottom is my collaborator, Susanna Gomez, generated them was like um, taking trajectory data, calculating the average density in there. So these are the snapshots and then have a look, okay, do I really have a constant density inside my, um, my corridor? Did the experiment, so to say, equilibrate? And here are two just um, slot slices through this data um, that uh, you see, you could claim that this has equilibrated, but it depends very much. This is a nice experiment. So this is where I say we are probably closest to what I call in terms of the density uh, to an equilibration. But um, there are different types of experiments. And especially if we look at the data, then um, since I do have the time, I might show it to you. Let's see if my internet connection allows it. Then um, <clears throat> you can really see very different and very varying densities, which clearly violates the assumption of the model that we have. Okay, so what do we wanna do or what is interesting? At the moment for the first part, we, I showed you this GSPT and we assumed that the density is actually, uh, that the, the, the geometry is smooth. So all the functions had to be C1 and um, yeah, I have to have, to have derivatives, but what if I have, for example, a piecewise constant corridor? Um, as I said, the estimation of Vmax and D as well as maybe the A and the B from the real, using real data, that would be really nice. And also in this case, what we assumed at the beginning was that the V of rho is V max times one minus rho over rho max, which um, says, okay, the parameters that I want to identify is V max and rho max, but I could use any other parameterization. I mean, this is not set in stone, so non-parametric parameterization. Um, there are the papers, and I don't know if this link is going to work. Uh, unfortunately not, it doesn't look like it, but maybe I can. <laughs> but yeah, I, probably if I have the time, if you want to have a look at the data, I, I have to say Armin Seifert and his co-workers did an amazing job putting up this database. You can find for every experiment video data, you can get the trajectory data, and I would like to thank them very much for um, being very patient and always asking my question. I'm sorry that I don't have access right now, but you can find everything here. And so thank you very much for um, coming. Happy to take any questions. And yeah, I forgot to say Merry Christmas. Okay, so thanks. Uh, uh, let's thank our speaker first. <laughs> any questions and comments? Any uh, <laughs> I cannot see the participant, so <laughs> maybe something uh, in the chat. I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, there is something in, in the chat, yeah. Um, okay, so it says, has the Laplacian model been solved using Schwartz 
Christoffel mappings or was it a simple model decomposition? Um, so what happened in this talk, just to, um, uh, when I think you're referring the Laplace model. Do you, do you want to know how I calculate the, the, the uh, sorry, here we go. Um, does this refer to how I calculate the, um, the direction here? Because, yes, okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. I, I mean, one way how you can um, get the, um, let's add, something. So if I want to have um, the direction to the exit, then there are two ways how you can do it. The simplest is the iconal equation. So if I have the iconal equation, then what's happening is that you solve the gradient of u is equal to one, where one is the cost. But there is also an approach which was by, uh, and I hope, I don't know, I never piccoli, I think it's with one c, I'm sorry. Ah, Benedetto, don't take it personally, and <laughs> to see where they propose that instead of solving um, the an iconal equation, you so solve the Laplace equation, Laplace of u is equal to zero. And at the exits you set, so in this case, this would be my exit. So I denote it by sigma. So I set a, u equal to a small value, u bar at the exit. And to a much higher value, u upper bar, at the rest of the domain, at the omega without the sigma. So this gives you then, again, um, it generates a much smoother potential and you then, uh, this is terrible because, yeah, it should be the great, yeah. And then the, sorry, let's do this properly. We denote this by phi. Uh, and then u is always the gradient of phi. And either we took the iconal equation or here we took the Laplacian. And this is, as I said, the uh, paper by Piccoli and Dussin, and it gives you just much smoother profiles. So no Christoffel symbols uh, involved. Sorry, hope that makes it clear. Okay, any, any other question? Uh, I have a I, I have a question for this fundamental diagram. Mm -hmm. So you 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 take uh, this linear relation between the velocity and the density, mm -hmm. but any other uh, nonlinear relation you can think of? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, this is not set in stone. I, uh, sorry, I just add one more page here. So for the fundamental diagram, what you can do is so. As I said, you, you usually, you always, if you look at the data, it, it really depends on the situation that you're looking. So um, mm -hmm. for unidirectional flow, it looks different than something than what is called a bidirectional flow. So bidirectional, I have two groups walking in um, towards each other. So this is always for the situation specific. And um, I've seen in general, there is something like a VMAX. So there is a, maximum speed that you have, then there is some clogging density rho max where you say, okay, now things get tricky. Afterwards, as Armin sometimes pointed out or I learned from him, you have to stop and go waves where people get stuck, then um, 